In Star Wars The Clone Wars, we were introduced to a dizzying number of clone trooper variants and specializations. This wasn't just so that they could sell you more toys, but born out of necessity and a pursuit of perfection. The GAR needed to be capable of fighting on any planet at a moment's notice, whereas the CIS droid army constantly designed and manufactured new droid models to fight in new battlefronts, the GAR relied on the strength of its clone troopers and their specialized training and equipment. The Kaminoans designed the Grand Army of the Republic with the ability to deploy and operate anywhere in the galaxy, be it underwater, on land, underground, or in the skies above. The classical elements of water, earth, fire, and air are a popular foundation for understanding the world by many cultures, both in and outside the Star Wars universe. Each element has its purpose, strengths, and weaknesses, and it's only through the mastery of all four that balance and harmony can be brought. In this video, we're going to be discussing the four classical clone elements and which one was the best to be in. Water. Earth. Attention, Sergeant on deck! In their pursuit of creating the perfect army to fight a galactic spanning war, the Kaminoans designed the Grand Army of the Republic to be effective on any possible battlefront. Ever the perfectionists, they continue to iterate and improve upon different elements of the clone army, learning from the experiences on the front lines. Perfection, to the Kaminoans, was about having the right mix of trooper, training, tools, and tactics guarantee success on the battlefield. Clones were either handpicked or volunteered for these various specializations during the early stages of their development and were trained by a mix of in-person instruction and use of Kamino's advanced training simulators. There's not much we can do. Since the clone homeworld of Kamino was a water world, we'll start with the depths below the ocean's surface. Clone scuba troopers wore pressurized clone dive armor that featured six propulsion jets and flippers to allow them to move swiftly underwater. Their helmets were supplied with oxygen by two breathing tubes that connected to an aqua breathing kit equipped to their back. They were armed with double-barreled DC-12U beam rifles specifically manufactured by Blastech Industries for use underwater, along with a flashlight to see in the dark depths of the deep sea. They were also trained to operate the Republic's OMS Devilfish Sub, manufactured by Kuat Drive Yards, for faster movement and greater firepower. Scuba Troopers saw action on various aquatic worlds, most notably the Mon Cala, where they squared off against the Quarren and the Separatist AQ series battle droids. While their air would not run out due to their aqua breathers capturing oxygen directly from the water, it was difficult to be a scuba trooper as there was no relief from battle. Troopers could not take off their helmets to eat or drink, and God forbid one of these clones had to go to the bathroom during a long campaign. Their environment was also cold and forgiving, and if they were wounded at extreme depths, it almost certainly meant death. After the Clone Wars, scuba troopers were replaced by Imperial Aquatic Assault Troopers, or Sea Troopers. Clone Flame Troopers were a unique branch of clone troopers whose main speciality was incinerating everything in their path, which in today's world would be considered a war crime. Flame Troopers donned specialized MK2 hotspot insulated armor with plenty of flame retardant protection to go around. It was also designed to dissipate heat more efficiently, making it more comfortable for the wearer. They were trained in the use of incendiary weapons, and their weapon of choice was the BTX-42 Republic Flamethrower. During the Second Battle of Geonosis, many clone lives were saved by these brave war criminals when they cleared out the caves and catacombs of Geonosis. While not especially effective against battle droids, flame troopers were instrumental in clearing out Genosian warriors, eliminating the risk of potential ambushes underground by simply making a mockery of the Geneva Conventions. Bring in the flamethrowers! Flamethrowers weren't only effective at burning everything in front of them, they also served as a powerful psychological weapon that struck fear into the hearts of the enemy, lowering morale and potentially forcing a retreat. Use of flamethrowers in the battlefield was limited, however, as the range of the flamethrower was quite short, 
and holding a highly flammable device made you a juicy target for the enemy. After the Clone Wars, flame troopers were replaced by Imperial Incinerator Troopers, also known as Burners. Most notable for their participation in the Second Battle of Geonosis, Clone Desert Troopers were trained to withstand high heat conditions on desert planets. Designed to operate independently and without much support, they served in reconnaissance roles and in search operations. Their helmets were specialized to minimize the glare of the sun, and their armor was supplemented by additional cooling units and sand filters. Skilled at operating in zero visibility environments, Desert Troopers could walk right through sandstorms without even blinking. Please, we're not getting anything over here. We're off. We must be way off. Negative. It is here. The data specifically states it has got to be. We've scanned the area three times. This, this is a wasteland and there's nothing. They were often deployed with additional armor support in the form of AT-RTs, ATTEs, and Republic Juggernaut tanks. Each trooper was issued a survival backpack that contained additional rations and water in case they found themselves stranded with no evac available. Desert troopers usually ended up facing Genosian B1 battle droid variants, but often found themselves fighting the elements more than the enemy. Desert troopers were incredibly independent, resourceful, and resilient troops that were key to the Republic's victory on desert planets like Geonosis. After the Clone Wars, desert troopers were replaced by Imperial Sand Troopers. Clone Jetpack Troopers or Aerial Troopers specialized in the art of gaining the high ground. We've actually made a full video about these guys before, and they were criminally underused during the Clone Wars. Jetpack Troopers' increased maneuverability gave them the ability to outflank heavy enemy forces and rapidly deploy from LAAT gunships without the need for parachutes. They were also used to scale the walls of enemy fortresses and participate in rescue missions between ships. Some units, such as the 104th Battalion, specialized in aerial tactics that they used for infiltration and rescue missions. Despite all these advantages, there was a major downside to flying around with the jetpack, however. It tended to draw a lot of attention and enemy fire. Unlike airborne clone paratroopers, who were designed to get from gunship to ground in the fastest time possible, jetpack troopers relied extensively on their JT-12 jetpacks to stay in the air for as long as possible. Manufactured by Merson Munitions, the JT-12 jetpack could reach average speeds of 145 km an hour and was the same model of jetpack used by the clone template Django Fett. Jetpack troopers were often equipped with thermal detonators and rocket launchers, along with standard DC-15A and DC-17 hand blasters. Perhaps the most memorable use of aerial troopers was under the command of Captain Rex during the Battle of Anaxis. Jetpack troopers would find themselves facing the Separatist D1 series aerial battle droids, also known as the D-Wing droids, and B2 variants such as the B2 RP and its bigger cousin the B2 Super Rocket Droid, both of which were equipped with rockets and internal jetpacks. Jetpack troopers were often embedded inside other clone detachments and served as highly mobile infantry units. Jetpack troopers continued the ancient tradition of the Republic's elite rocket jumpers and fought valiantly to save the Republic. After the Clone Wars, they were replaced by Imperial Jump Troopers. Each clone element served to complement the other, to provide strength where the other was weak. The clone troopers of each element were the very best at what they do, but while the master of one is better than none, it still leaves them with blind spots. While it's difficult to choose the best clone element to be in, we would say the most versatile and widely used class would be the clone jetpack troopers. With their use of portable high ground, they saw a lot of action during the Clone Wars, adding another dimension to the battlefield and giving Republic commanders the upper hand in many situations. So, that's our take on the classical four clone elements, but what do you think? Which element would you want to be and why? Free to post your thoughts in the comment section below. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.